Hello, Tyler Bryden here. I hope everything is going well today. Let's jump right into it. Talk about what is synth wave. And so we have an article written by Anderson Horowitz. We've got Zaya Yang here and Christina Shin. I've got both their LinkedIn profiles. I'll pull them up and put them in the video if you're interested in them. And it's an interesting article that brings out this term synth AI. And I apologize to the company, Synth AI, I guess, the offering by Siemens here, because they coined this new term, which is around wave two of large language models, generative AI, and specifically focusing on B2B use cases. And talk about a little bit of the history. And this history is obviously not that long. Some of this stuff has just emerged in the last couple of years and then hit another wave of adoption in the last six months. And generative AI, which means basically you've got prompt, you've got information that is coming out of that. And I think a big example of this, if I pull it up quickly, would be Jasper AI, maybe copy AI, where basically we are inputting text, you are then getting out an output that is often marketing copy or some essay writing, et cetera, et cetera. Same thing with Jasper, both of these dominant forces in this space with Jasper being definitely a leader and a huge valuation and revenue or run rate on that company. And then they talk about this wave two, which is much more of this synthesis. And I think this is obviously where the term synth AI comes from, synthesis AI. The impact it's going to have on B2B, the business world, as we better understand generative AI technology, large language models, how they can be used in different contexts, and then even maybe how they become more vertical specific. They also claim, and again, shout out to the people who wrote this and made this effort, Isaiah here and Christina. I originally saw this post. I was like, why do I have Alex Hope? He was the original person who shared the article and then brought it to my attention. And so these two, one partner, one general partner at Anderson Horowitz, one of the best investment firms in the world and in history in terms of venture capital, talk about the step function change that Synth AI is going to bring. And a few interesting points that I think are just worthwhile touching on. I'll say right from the gate that maybe this is a bit controversial, but I do think it's a little bit of semantics at this point. I'm not sure if they're making some investments in this space and trying to build the, the the industry or that this is a thing. I think there may be some reason of why, maybe besides just a thesis that this is being created, why diverge from this term generative AI. And of course, there's reasoning in this article, but in the end, synthesis is uh, somewhat of a generative function, which there is this argument around that generative AI is just creating maybe more noise or it's creating a ton of information. Whereas the synth AI, the second wave here is taking all of this information and then synthesizing it, of course, and then con putting that into a very concise output. But that concise output is still using a generative format or process to it. It's just more of a tight output or a smaller output, more concise one that you're looking for versus the other generative AI function of copywriting or content production or ad creating, where we're obviously looking for maybe longer forms of output. Now, one of the arguments that they talk about is crossing the bridge from consumer to enterprise. And AI as consumers, our, object, our objectors are towards having fun and having something to share. In some cases, I believe this is true. And we've seen not just with text ones, but in chat GPT and all these text-based solutions, we've obviously seen DALI and stable diffusion and more of image generation versions of this. But uh, I actually think that the underest there is an underestimated function that's not described here about people using these tools in a very practical, productive way already. And I'm already talking to many professionals, whether it's like, first of all, I'm having the experience of using ChatGPT for functions often in place of where I would go to Google Pass and maybe not get the exact response that I was looking for. My partner as a solutions architect is starting to. We're talking to more people who are using that. And I think we're now seeing this movement of it being an open tab or a bookmark that is available and being used in a lot of knowledge work for some pretty powerful. So I actually think that the having fun, something to share, I think this is, I think this is, it's not highlighting enough the productive practical uses that 
consumers are using this technology for and they do talk about when it comes to b2b application the objectives are different there's a cost benefit assessment around time and quality and you want to be able to generate better quality within the same amount of time or generate the same quality but faster and so this is where the initial translation from b to c to b2b has broken down and i would say that people like businesses in, in B2B applications, we value our time. And I actually think we look at this much more practically than maybe outlined here, which is I'm using this to save a significant amount of time or generate the same quality or faster. And maybe there's a little bit of a difference for me as a founder of a company and operating in a business in that sense. But I think there are a lot of working professionals who also view themselves and their time as extremely valuable and also rely on it for this type of work and output, much more focused on the practical use of these tools with that better quality and same amount of time or generate the same quality, but faster as a main reason for use. A lot of other people that I'm using it would not be using these t tools if it was only for entertainment. They don't view that as worthwhile, but as it's become valuable in the business, then it has become worthwhile to them and something that they're actually using. Talk about in the sort of continuation of this about it being like in a workplace setting quality mattering. It's possible for some tasks today. It's good for short ads or maybe some idea generation. But in many cases, it's not truly valuable in a personalized way, in a quality of content. There's lots of debates about is this kind of content ranking online? I have proof that it is, but I think in the end, maybe the human readable experience and the quality content will be indicated that it's not as good at executing that as we thought besides maybe some informational queries. And so in the end, they talk about in wave one applications, the answer is frequently that we're better off doing it ourselves. And I think that's true in some cases, but I also think we're on the edge of that many times where that's not necessarily the case. And there's already examples in my own life and in other systems, whether that's BuzzFeed and companies using this to achieve, maybe there is some human correction and editing to it, but overall the quality is actually quite strong and that value proposition is starting to become clear. Now, talk about wave two, converging information for improved decision-making. And I think there is, I actually believe in this argument or this idea around wave two, We've been working on that at Speak for a long time with that value proposition of turning language data into insights, doing it fast and with no code. That's been a value proposition that has been then supported by the introduction of these large language models. And we have something like a bunch of Amazon reviews. This could be too much data to look overall, but if I want to take all this data I want to create some analysis from it. So give me five, even something as, as broad as that, give me five meaningful takeaways. I can then query that entire Amazon data. So this is still a relatively small sample size and I'll be able to get the synthesis of that. So already within Speak, the system that I've been working on for several years, synthesis was a more valuable function, but the, um, way to get to it is still a generative AI process. So I think there is this, and we've got the results here. So again, taking this data, giving me five, I asked takeaways, very concise um, here from that data set. And we've now unlocked or looked at this layer of synthesis. But again, I argue that this is generative in its output is just a more concise or controlled version of generative AI with maybe a more defined purpose. So that's Speak AI doing that, saying here's the assistant type I want. And then you can obviously go much more concise on the actual prompt area to then make your synthesis even more profound. And we've done things like SWOT analysis or give me specific pain points or things like that. I just wanted to give you a quick example, but we've seen this over and over again within our work, not even just within, not just even within these new models of large language models, but we also had a lot of like visualization of data within speak. And I, I've got it here where we've got the transcript layer, but then we've got all the insights and we can extract out great, all these topics and we can extract out people and keywords, but that becomes an overwhelming amount of information and people don't want to be overwhelmed with information. They want the specific concise answer that they're looking for in that time. And this is what this is now bringing. And speaking from experience of that, like even when we summarize it at a higher level, I've just took all these speeches from this public speech or I can aggregate that data together, visualize it, but okay, inflation was here. I can click, I can open, I can examine inflation, see a bunch of things. I can go listen back to exact moments, whatever. 
very powerful, but it still is a huge amount of manual work and labor that I see as being eliminated with synth AI. So I do understand, again, the, the argument made within this and the value of it, because I've seen it for many years now, we speak with over 30,000 people giving us feedback on, oh, this is too much information, or we just want to do this and ask this question and get the answer. And so the synth AI still here thesis around it is definitely super valuable. And they talk about the opposite of the chat GPT user face. Instead of writing long form responses based on concise prompt, what if we could reverse engineer from massive amounts of data, the concise prompt that summarize it. So talking about UX that conveys large information as efficiently as possible, which is something that we've struggled with at Speak. They give an example here with, they also give another example with Zoom Info, which is an incredible company that bought, that bought Chorus AI and then is integrating GPT into it. And they share this example of how that, that could work. So I'll put this on for a second. I want to put the music on just copyright, but simple, optimize my day get responses, couple prompts and cues here. And again, still quite a bit of information directly in here, but you've maybe eliminated this from hundreds and hundreds of additional contexts down to very specific ones. And then it's giving you some opportunities. This is again, more generative AI, but it combined that synthesis level to then work with that, to then make that task more even approachable or direct or clear. And then we've got some other in here. So this is just a demo, but we can start to see like how this could be used in a B2B use case. Obviously they highlighted this, which I think is interesting and talk about how you were then implementing synth AI into the business. And this is something that we've seen at Speak AI is like the high volume of information such that it's not pragmatic for human to manually sift through all the information. and. I can say even when it's research firms doing something like focus groups or interviews, once you cross five interviews, it becomes very time consuming to manually review that information. A lot of times it's someone outside who maybe doesn't have the full perspective who's tasked for analyzing it, or it's often then the people who are conducting the interviews who have to analyze and they don't want to go and revisit the entire thing. So they're looking for more tools like synth AI or systems like synth AI, like that prompting feature that I showed you within speak to be able to handle that. And, and then they also talk about a high signal to noise rate ratio, such as that themes or insights are obvious and consistency. In the name of accuracy, you don't want an AI model to, to decipher nuance. I would actually argue that it is possible. You just need to be able to set the context and the prompt up properly. And so, for example, in the speak ex one that I shared, you like set it up as a research assistant. And then if it was Amazon reviews, an example, you say, these are Amazon reviews for a product in this industry. We are this company in this industry trying to compete against this product. And if you set up that, context, then the ability to decipher nuance becomes very, I guess, much closer to an output that a real human could have in detecting nuance. And then with the computational ability and the statistical understanding of themes and things that emerge, it becomes very powerful when you combine that all, because generally what we're seeing from people is they're often maybe coming up with intuitive gut feelings based on their own expertise and knowledge, but they're also trying to back that with evidence that is somewhat numerical or quantitative. And so when you combine that qualitative expertise that can be driven by a properly prompted engine with some human oversight with the quantitative understanding it has of data, you can quickly make this possible. And that's, again, I think where synth AI starts to, again, I think they put a lot of work into this article here with some nice little charts and about synth AI effectiveness, where there's some potential, where there's low potential, where there's high potential. And you can see from a high potential part, resolving customer support issues, summarizing market survey results in communities and things like forum and Twitter and YouTube comments and just YouTube as general. This is where we're actually seeing a lot of our users on speak. And then you've got some potential, which I think, which is what we've seen people already using, which is summarize feedback across customer conversations, summarize product usage. I think there are some very clear use cases on this and product product feedback interviews and things like that, as well as chats on intercom, which is started to embed this technology. There's some pretty obvious use cases where there's so much information flowing in and you're looking to have tools to be able to manage that. Now, there are the last as it starts to close out this functionality or this comparison between these two, 
there are some things about the outcomes that are in, involved. And uh, basically that direct comparison that we can see is generate ad copy versus in wave one gen, gen AI versus wave two, which is inform which email campaign a customer should get based on usage, design ideal cadences. So you can start to see in a very clear way that they've laid it out, the differences there. Now, again, some of it is semantics are arguably, but I think they've done a good job thinking about that. And I did want to touch on one thing here, which this ChatGPT retrieval plugin, which basically allows you to almost basically embed your company or personal data into what is basically called an embeddings, which then can be used, the chat GPT function can be used to basically chat with that database and you can query it, ask questions. And some of this synth AI opportunities are then uncovered and given an opportunity to actually use in a very methodical way. So this, most of us don't have access to this yet because it's in chat GPT in the plugins. And so there's only beta users who are getting access to this, but I think this unlocks another layer of synth AI that I think is super meaningful and valuable. Now, that's just, uh, I think, something important that we're going to see continued uses of this. And I think they talk about, it's highlight chat GPT a couple of times. I think it's going to be more capable of synth AI here in synthesis. And then there's going to be a continued synthesis that um, emerges cohere, talking about building enterprise large language models, more and more companies starting to try to build their own LLMs. And with that, a lot of the purpose of it will be synth AI more on trained specific data within an organization than the large data sets that GP, chat GPT is just driving through the entire internet. It'll be much more specific and we'll start to see that become a very big component of businesses and organizations over the next few years. So a couple last points on about, which I think is super interesting, is the battle to own the workflow. So the prize is not about who can build the AI synthesis capability, it's who can own the workflow. And this is where they actually talked about Zoom Info and then combined with, say, Chorus AI. And th those things is if you are part of um, the entire workflow, and we talk, see this as workflow enablement a lot, is like LLMs will be perhaps commoditized, but... Um, if you can fit intuitively and natively within workflows, then you have a lot of power to then unlock the synth AI capabilities. And we've seen that within our space. It looks like Sprig talks about it too, as people want to hook into Zoom and then um, automatically grab those recordings, turn that into a database, that a database will become an embeddings library that then you can search and query at any time and you want to be able to then push those results to your own databases or through Zapier to something or to a specific number of team members on the team. And so to auto, to integrate and then automate these workflows is becoming a huge part of the value proposition as these LLMs get more adoption, as they get more use and as the and becomes more commoditized or be able to be created in-house by teams or at least providers like Cohere and things like that. And even us at Speak AI, we're, we're automating the creation of embedding. And so that part is becoming pretty clear on how to do. And now it's, can you effectively grab data, analyze that data, and then pass the results to where it needs to go. Super interesting. I appreciate these, uh, these two for making this description of Synth AI. I think we'll see more discussions on this or maybe more terminology around it. If you are interested in this, check out Speak AI. It's super fascinating. There's more and more options just apart from the demo that I sh shared in this uh, that are, are effectively doing this wave two functionality. We did focus on what can be extracted and analyzed versus what can be created because we thought that was a well-served part of the market. And it seems that there is a thesis here that's emerging from one of the best investment firms in the world right now. So definitely worthwhile checking out. They've done a lot of great stuff in the space. And if they're talking about this and thinking about it, there must be a reason behind it. I hope this video was insightful. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. Thank you so much for checking this out. This has been Tyler Bryden looking at synth AI versus generative AI. What are the difference? What's coming? What's happening here? And I appreciate you checking it out very much. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye.